Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's the 10th of July. Hope you're having a good week so far. If you get a chance, listen to the message this morning that I put on earlier. The most important question will ever be asked Elon Musk, Donald Trump, and Joe Biden. If you get a chance, listen to that message. Mark's been reading through Phyllis versus the State of Missouri. We're ready for Chapter 21. Today he's going to read Chapter 21, The Absolute Sovereignty of God, Chapter 22, Predestination, Election, and Effectual Calling, and then uh, he'll read the final chapter in the book tomorrow, Chapter 23. If you're interested in obtaining a copy of this book, Phyllis versus the State of Missouri, I'd be more than happy to send you a copy if you go to LarryWPhillips.com, go to our contact section and email me and request a book. I'll be happy to send you a copy. I'll turn this over to Mark. Chapters 21-22. Phil Skirts, the State of Missouri, chapters 21-22. to Chapter 21, The Absolute Sovereignty of God. I want to start this chapter by saying I am so very thankful for someone who introduced me to a book called The Sovereignty of God by Arthur W. Peake. I strongly recommend this work to everyone who reads my book. Peake's book had a profound influence on my life. It caused me to get into the study of the Word of God for myself and not take other people's words for what the Word of God says. God is absolutely absolute. No, I am not overstating it. If he is not absolutely absolute, he would not be God. God works all things after counsel of his own will. I also strongly recommend recommend the study of Isaiah all the way through the book of Isaiah, the prophet, in the most profound way. It articulates the absolute sovereignty of God. Chapters 43, 44, 45, and 46 are phenomenal. Anyone who reads them and still denies that God is sovereign just does not believe the Bible. Isaiah says, There is no God beside me, and Job says, He will say unto him, What do is what do is thou. So much of the book of Isaiah can be prepared to and studied in parallel to the ninth chapter of Romans. Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same love to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? This is the absolute declaration that God is not dependent upon his creatures. He is independent of his creatures and his creation. If one molecule goes awry, then God is not sovereign. During the 9-11 attacks, I remember well-known Phil Evangelist T. Jakes saying, My God would never do anything like this. Well, P. Jakes must not have read the Old Testament. The Old Testament is full of examples of God's wrath and judgment exhibited. Not only in the weather, but in fire and brimstone and hail and whirlwinds, which are tornadoes and hurricanes and all kinds of pestilences and plagues. God is very much active in the lives of men on a daily basis. God says, I am the Lord, I change not. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God is over everything. We can go to the book of Job to see that Satan had to get God's permission before he did anything to Job. God would not allow Satan to kill Job. Here are some key words to look up that affirm God's sovereignty over our lives, bounds of our habitation, potter, clay, predestination, election, ordination, judgment, and providence. There is a misinterpretation by the Arminians regarding foreknowledge. They saw that God looked down to the portals of time and saw those that would choose him, and so consequently... He elected them. This is the denial of the doctrine of election and predestination. Therefore, no means to know one intimately. As Adam knew his wife Eve intimately, Jesus Christ knew each one of those whom he would come and die for on an intimate basis before they were even born. He had a purpose to decree and predestinate them. The word predestinate means to predetermine what happens before it happens. So God is a sovereign over the weather, over his providence, over life and death, and yes, even the wind and the sea obey him. Most important, God is sovereign in our salvation. Once we come to accept the realization that God is sovereign, there is tremendous rest for the people of God. No, we're not cooperative agents. No, we do not have the free will in our eternal salvation. 
No, we do not describe the doctrine of the Council of Trent like the Roman Catholics. The true gospel is all sovereign grace. As it relates to divine providence, Joseph told his brothers who meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Because the evil perpetuated on Joseph, God took these events. The outcome was a stain on Jacob's son during the Great Famine. There's a special exclusive blessing to God to elect for a total and totally undeserving of benefits listed in Romans 8, 28 to 32. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to whom was called according to his purpose. To whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate that he could form the image of his son, that he might be the first born among many brethren. And over whom he did predestinate them, he also called and whom he called, then he also justified, and whom he justified, then he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things, that God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God is sovereign in governments, he brings kingdoms down, and he raises kingdoms up. God is sovereign in the declaration of his word. God is sovereign as it relates to whose hearts are quickly by the spirits of God, whose hearts are hardened. So God's sovereignty is a very important consideration. If we in any way deny the absolute sovereignty of God, we are denying God himself and who he says he is in his holy word. God says, I am that I am. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father. So once we recognize God's sovereignty in all things, we view God and His Word in the world in a totally different light. Chapter 22, Predestination, Election, Effectual Calling. Predestination is a doctrine that most people hate and abhor vehemently. Someone very close to me once said that it was the most damnable doctrine in the Bible. Now this person calls himself a Christian. Destination is absolutely one of the most invigorating, calming, comforting documents for true believers. Predestination means to predetermine beforehand what happens to you. If you don't predetermine what happens to us, the appeal from the Unity Church of Christianity of false cult says that you can choose your own parents, that you can choose your own destiny. Timothy they said right before they injected that fatal needle into the vein. I am the master of my own fate, and I am in charge of my own destiny. Timothy Bay, no, you are not. Predestination, as found in the Bible, does not just have to do with people, i.e., the who, like many printed maps, affirm. Also, the what mean other events in our lives. See that very clearly in Scripture in Ephesians 1.11. Many people who deny this Scripture accuse those of us the affirmative of being fatalist, making God the author, said it on and on and on. There is a distinction between evil and sin, and we know the serpent was the most subtle beast to feel in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3 1, we also know that God created both elect and not elect angels. It is very clear because of God's absolute sovereignty that He would have created only elect angels had He is chosen. They chose to do so is also very clear because God is sovereign of all things that he would have restrained Lucifer from sinning and had he chosen to do so. Lucifer was committed to rebel against God and sin. Why are election, predestination, affection calling such a controversial in theological circles today? That is the question I would like to pose in this 22nd chapter. The reason election, predestination, affection calling are such controversial doctrines is because they bring the human pride down and show man his total depravity and show man his total inability of himself to hunt the Christ apart from the quickening power of the Holy Spirit. Predestination is a marvelous physical doctrine. Once a person understands the significance of it and the assurance that gives elect child of God and is her faith, looking in Ephesians, we find a clear realization of this beautiful doctrine. Ephesians 1, 4, 5, we read, according to his chosen us and him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself, according to good pleasure as well. These two verses set out the work of predestination by God and salvation. 
And now we see all the predestined issues not going to the who, but also who the what as a providential hand of God and predestination, which can be found in verse 11. It states that who also we obtain in the heritage be predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things at the counsel of his own will. Going further, we also see another very strong explanation. Example of this beautiful doctrine, Romans 8. Just call the Roman Lord of salvation. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. For whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be performed the image of his Son. He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called. Whom he called, then he also justified. And whom he justified, then he also glorified. So shall we then say to these things, God before us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him. Just about them. Who shall we then say to him, God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything in the charge of God's elect? Is God that justifieth? As was stated earlier, predestination means to predetermine beforehand what happens. There are two words that are used multiple times, both the Old and New Testament elect and election. If you look in Isaiah 42, 1, we will find one of the first examples of the word elect being used. The sentiment for elect is chosen. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my elect, and whom my soul is, I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. We also see the term used again in Isaiah 45, 4. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. This can also be used as example of sexual calling. God says to the prophet Isaiah that God has called them by their name Israel. Isaiah 65, 8, 9 states, And I will bring forth the seed out of Jacob, and out of Judah and inheritor of my mountains, and my elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. Jesus, when he was present on this earth, spoke about his elect. Let's go back to the New Testament, Luke 18, 7. The reason I'm going into more specific scriptures in this chapter is that I want to prove to you that these terms are used multiple times in both the Old and New Testament. Luke 18, 7 says, And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? Romans 8, 33 Paul states, who shall lay anything to charge of God's elect? Is God the justifieth? Many people are not familiar with all the times the word elect is for reference to the Bible. Colossians 3.12 states, put on therefore as elect God, holy and beloved, vows of mercy, kindness, humble, most of mind, meekness, long suffering, as we stated earlier, the eternal elect means to be chosen by God. There were chosen angels, and there were angels that were not chosen to remain forever in communion with God. There were angels that did not keep their first estate because they were not chosen by God to keep their first estate. The first Timothy five twenty one it states I share she before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Elect angels that thou observe these things without referring one before another, doing nothing by partiality in Second Timothy two. Paul states Therefore, I endure all things for the sake, sake that they may also obtain their salvation, which is in Christ, Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Again, who are the elect? The elect are those who are chosen or predestinated, stated, and are officially called by God. We go further and look at Titus 1 1, we find that St. Paul asserts God. The apostle who was Christ according to the faith of God who left the knowledge and the truth of that for God of us. First Peter one two, Peter said the left according to the four knowledge of God the Father. The sanctification of the Spirit and the is sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. First Peter five thirteen. Peter states the church 
is that Babylon elected to get abused, Lord, if you, and so does Marcus, my son. Finally, we find in Second John 1, 1, John tells us the elder of the elect lady showed her whom I love the truth. And not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. So we can see that there are many different times when God's elect are referred to in both the Old and New Testament. Now let's look at the terminology of election, the difference in the meaning of election. Elect is this, a word, elect means chosen. And the word election means choice. The chosen are recipients of being chosen by God. Romans 9.11 says, For children be not yet born, neither having done any good or evil person of God, according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. I looked at Romans 1, 11, 11, 5, which I looked at Romans 11:5, which states, "Even so, in this present time, also there is a remnant for election of grace." Romans 11:28 says, "As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, or as touching election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes." God chose Israel for His people, not because they have the greatest faith the number of all the tribes of the earth. He chose them because he fixed his love upon them. Now let's discuss the term official calling. The word calling in the Bible refers to divine summons by God. From the 1129 says, he gives the calling of God without repentance. Once God calls the elect, he never casts us out. He says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me and no man can pluck them out of my hand and no one can pluck them out of my father's hand that she may know what the hope of his calling and what the riches of his glory and his fairness and the saints or the succeeding greatness of his power to us for to believe according to the working of his mighty power. Philippians 3.14, Paul tells us, I press for the mark for the prize the high calling of God, Christ Jesus. Is the high calling, the divine summons, is a resistible call by irresistible uh, is Irresistible call by God. In Second, Second, Second Thessalonians 1 11, Paul declares, where for also we pray always for you that our God be counts you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness. And the work of faith with power. Notice that all the glory is given to God, our Lord Jesus Christ, and his work. His high calling and his work of faith in our hearts, Hebrews 3.11 says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. To summarize, we have covered in this chapter predestination, election, the word election, special calling. I would strongly recommend that you do a word study on these terms or open your eyes through the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Next time we'll be reading chapters 23, Christ, Manifestation, Manifestation, Resurrection, and Life's Justification. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for reading that. And uh, tomorrow is the last chapter of this book. And I believe that Mark has now read through all five books that I've written. (laughs) So... uh, Hope you all have a blessed day today, and we'll hopefully see you tomorrow. God bless.